Hello everyone, Mary Rose here at Stitch Bliss Corner. I've been asked by some of my viewers to do a piece on Paula Vaughan, uh, just on her life and what has influenced her and just to show you some of her works that have been made into cross stitch, uh, beloved cross stitch pieces. Uh, she has a particular flair for evoking emotions in the person that looks at her work. Uh, and I, when I was thinking about doing Paula, I was just jotting down some words that I think come to the surface when you think about Paula Vaughan. And I have nostalgia, poignancy, symbolism, traditional values, love, sentimentality, simple pleasures, emotion evoking, and faith. Um, and I, I think that pretty much covers a lot of the motivations of Paula herself and also the reaction that people get when they look at her work. So I'm just going to go on now and cover her early life. Uh, then go on to her painting techniques and then finally to her some of the cross stitching that's come from her work. Um, because I think most people who cross stitch are familiar with at least one Paul, Paula Vaughan piece. Uh, here is Paula. Uh, in her studio probably and she's up, she's working on a piece there and so we'll just go on to what I have discovered about Paula Vaughan the remarkable Paula Vaughan the light is it's interesting really because the light coming in here is glaring one minute, overcast the next and everything else. And as you find out more about Paula, you'll find that lighting has been the bane of her life for her stitch, for her painting. Uh, she's had great difficulty in achieving the kind of light that she wants for when she's working. And I think that is a problem for a lot of artists. But for Paula, it's been particularly troubling at times for her. Anyway, Apola was born in a small town in northeast Mississippi. Her family moved to Memphis when she was four years old. She says that she loved to go to church. Life was simple. Swimming daily in summer, she was an avid reader. She enjoyed school and attending football and basketball games. Paula's mother was multi-talented and made all of her clothes and was a great cook and a great caring mother. Her father worked two jobs to provide for the family. They lived in a very close-knit neighbourhood where everyone helped everyone else. Uh, every other weekend, they went in their car to visit her grandparents in Mississippi. She met her husband, Tommy, at high school, and for Paula, it was love at first sight. She patiently waited for her chance to meet him. She describes him as a shy football player. I didn't know there were any of those. Uh, eventually, they began dating, and she asked, he asked her to marry him on her third date. But she was only 15 at the time, so they dated for another five years. Paula attended college for two years, but she left to go to work. Tommy stayed at college and did a cleaning job to make a little money. A week after he graduated, they married. Tommy and Paula moved into their first place, which was a brand new duplex is how she describes it. They had a Coleman ice chest and a mattress on the living room floor because that was where the air conditioner was. <laughs> uh, 
Tommy took up a teaching and coaching position and Paula found herself at home caring for two babies and her husband working for long hours. Well, that's a familiar ring to it, isn't it? Her sister-in-law was a painter and they decided to paint together one day. Paula said her first effort was not good. Uh, that would be in her eyes, I guess. But she was hooked. She became obsessed with painting and painted every spare moment she had. She said that if she had no time in the day, she would paint at night. She did this for 15 years with no intention of anyone seeing her work. Then one day she found herself selling her art. She said that she couldn't really figure out why anyone would want to purchase her work. A few years later, she and her husband decided to release a limited edition print. And she said this was a very educational experience and the main lesson to come out of it was that she wanted no part of printing and selling her own works. She has been with First Somerset House Publishing Company for some years, as well as Leisure Arts, or I think you could say Leisure Arts in America, Leisure Arts in Little Rock, who publishes cross-stitch patterns of her work. Her children are now grown up and married, and she now has grandchildren. She describes her creative process as laboured, as well as wonderful and inspired. She starts a picture full of hope and joy, but somewhere in the middle, she goes into a state of semi-depression and she has been known to throw a painting across the room. Well, she has good company there because if you remember from a previous video, if you saw it on Cezanne, he used to throw them out of the window and they used to lodge in trees and stay there for a year or so. So <laughs> I think it's part of the temperament of artists where they become very frustrated and something has to give, doesn't it, in those situations. She says that her husband should be given a gold star for living with her for all those years. After the semi-depressed stage, the painting enters into a new phase and after several days it seems to come to life to her. By the time she completes the painting, she often feels it is the best one she has ever done until she begins her next painting and then the cycle starts again. She has a deep and abiding Christian faith and thanks Jesus Christ for the blessings far beyond her dreams. So she obviously has a great connection with that divine spirit uh, that may well come into her work. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why so much of her work is revered by so many. Uh, so that's about Paula herself and I think I will now just go through her painting technique because it does uh, reflect on her work. So I've just summarized uh, her painting techniques here. Uh, she says, Tommy, her husband and creator of her web page, thought some of you might be interested in the more technical in brackets, rather than the emotional side of her art. I don't think he understands how closely they are joined together, but I will try to separate them for you as much as possible. And she says, I love my studio. For 19 years, I painted on the couch in the living room using only traditional lamplight. I am now paying the price for this and my eyes seem to be getting considerably worse every time I get them checked. Um, so in 1985, a studio was suggested for her and she had dreams of what she wanted. And one of those things was North Light. Well, a lot of artists want the light to come from the North. Unfortunately, the way the roof line had to be, it was not feasible. Um, I was disappointed, but figured artificial light could achieve the same effect. Uh, she'd read many articles about that and, and thought it was possible to do. Now, she said uh, her natural light source comes from the west, which is not really bad since I had a beautiful oak tree right outside the two double windows that filtered the light. Uh, I so enjoyed taking breaks from my work, looking out of the window at those birds who were frequent visitors to my beautiful tree. 
Tommy hung a birdhouse he and the boys made for me, and my western light was no problem at all. Now, she had a large drafting table that she worked off that had side pockets for her paints and brushes, and her husband, ever the practical person, I think this is the case of a practical person married to someone who was, who is a more uh, emotional person. And so they counterbalance each other probably extremely well. Um, well, that's just, that's my observation anyway. Um, he bought her a rolling adjustable chair. And she said before that I was using one of my kitchen chairs, which we had, uh, which when they had company, that chair had to go out of her studio and into the place at the table for the person to sit on. So, um, uh, let's see, back to the studio. It is 16 by 24 with a large closet that has shelves built in both ends to accommodate her prints and her watercolours. Bookshelves were built in the middle to hold her ever-growing collection of art books. Um, they put wide oak floors in the studio, which Tommy finished off with several coats of polyurethane. Everybody thought they were crazy, but it has been the most serviceable floor that she's ever had. I've spilt my paint many times along with turpentine and it always cleans up wonderfully with no stains. Now, life went on and Tommy took early retirement. Well, <laughs> that's not always a good thing. Um, a friend of mine, her husband took early retirement <laughs> and she always used to do the shopping. She'd go to the supermarket and do it all with no hazards or concerns or problems at all. Uh, but when her husband took retirement, it became like a military operation. You know, she, she'd turn up at the supermarket with him and the trolley had to be packed a certain way. And the items had to go in, through in order, you know, all the fruit and vegetables together, all the bottles together and all the rest of it. And, <laughs> and um, I think that probably is a problem for quite a few married couples uh, when they retire. And suddenly things that one person had been doing solo for so long suddenly gets another set of eyes and another set of hands on it, you know, and... Uh, it can be quite a challenge for people, you know, I think you have to prepare for retirement. Uh, and how did I get onto that? Sorry, I shall get back to what I was talking about. Now she said, he decided uh, to chop down her tree. Um, and she said, if I, because he said, being a practical person, this was, um, it hung over the roof and the leaves were stopping up the gutters. Well, I mean, in a storm or something, it could have fallen on the house or something. Like that, may, that may be the way he was thinking. And she said, I protested, but not nearly loud enough. If I had it over again, I would have lashed myself to that tree and told him if the tree went, so would I. <laughs> anyway, he and his uncle discussed it thoroughly and decided to go ahead. The deed was done, and the good sport that I am, I have to admit to this day, ten years later, I throw it up to them every time I get a chance. <laughs> well, that's family, isn't it? That's relationships. Um, and she said it was a mistake, because uh, she moved almost completely back to her oil paintings, which she really liked. And I think one of the reasons why oils are so popular with people is... With watercolours, if you make a mistake, I mean, you always start very light with your work. Uh, but as you go to the darker colours, if you make a mistake in your work, the whole work is ruined. Whereas with oil paintings, if you make a mistake, you just let it dry and then you just paint over it. So it's a very good medium for that, even though it can be a bit, uh, well, it's not as fine, of course, as watercolours. But she says with her oil paints, she does water them down, you know, she thins them out a lot, her oils, uh, probably because she likes the, the watercolour uh, texture and feel, you know. Um, anyway, she said that this, the light now, 
because Tommy probably thought he was solving her light problems <laughs> by getting rid of the tree. But she'd gone back to oil painting and when with oils the light shines off and can dazzle you as you're trying to paint. Uh, so Tommy's solution to this was to get her an easel that had, that had casters on the bottom so she could wheel it, wheel it round the studio uh, to vary her light source as, as it got too dazzling for her. So, I mean, he's a problem solver, if nothing else, isn't he? Even if he created the problem in the first place. Anyway, um, I'll get, get back to, to what Paula says. What a terrible mistake it was. By this time, I had moved almost completely back to my oils, which had been my first love. I loved my watercolours, but oils would give me the opportunity to broaden my subject matter. There were many wonderful things about oils that I could do that I couldn't with watercolours. In going back to the oils, and with no tree outside, my window lighting became a real problem. The glare off the oils while I was painting was killing my eyes. Morning wasn't so bad, but by two o'clock, the painting was becoming impossible. I would move my easel all over the studio, trying to escape the glare. I finally decided I would have to use artificial life, light. And Tommy has done everything he knows to, uh, how to help out with this problem. Um, now, they do have a studio in the mountains. And apparently... Mr. Pragmatic has decided that if there is another studio built, it will have to be downstairs because he wouldn't want me to give up painting just because I couldn't walk upstairs. <laughs> he is such a concerned husband. He is always telling me to be careful and not to fall and break anything. And then adds, but if you do, be sure to fall on your left arm since I paint with my right. <laughs> Um, see, a lot of this is very much tongue-in-cheek. Uh, and let's see, Tommy is a fine craftsman. After many hours of discussion of what I wanted for my easel design, he came up with a wonderful design. And uh, be, besides being practical, my easel is beautiful. The old cherry, this was some wood that they had in their barn, has mellowed to a wonderful patina. And even though and now streaked with paint, it, in places it is still a great joy to me. It has wonderful casters so you can roll it easily all over the floor. She says, now to my palette of colours. I have a paint box full of the most exotic and wonderful sounding names for paint you have ever heard of, and I no longer even put them out. Circling my palette from left to right with no rhyme or reason for where they are, except for habit, are the following colours. Titanium white, thallo blue, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, burnt umber, burnt sienna, thallo green, viridian green, Windsor violet, alizarin crimson, grumbacker red, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, raw sienna, and Indian yellow. I use old Holland paints in many colours, loving the smoothness of the paint. Um, and then she, she, she puts this little tribute in here to Tommy. I wouldn't tell him, but he is a vital part of my work, taking many undesirable chores off of me and leaving me much more time for dreaming and for painting. Um, then she goes on to talk about her canvas. Uh, after my canvas is stretched, I lay out my picture for my, my drawing. Um, by drawing my main focal point in detail on the canvas and sketching the rest, this final drawing is arrived at after doing several loose sketches to achieve proper placement. I sometimes draw the piece out on paper and transfer it onto the canvas with graphite paper. Some things are ultimately painted in. For watercolour, I use... Well, she was talking about a board that she used for watercolour, and it used to be splittable, this board, but the new version is not. It used to drive Tommy crazy when I would work on a piece for a month 
and then split the board in two. He always said one day I was going to tear one of my paintings in half, and thank goodness I never did. I have to admit, after my paintings started selling, I stopped separating the board. However, the good part about this board is if you mess up on one side, you can turn it over and paint on the other side. A lot of my watercolours have a partially finished picture on the back side. Um, she says, as for my technique, that is really hard to explain. I don't think I have one. With my oils, I paint very thin. I think as a result of painting with watercolour for so long. With no formal training, for which I constantly regret, I just seem to blunder along. When I don't know what else to do, in desperation, I pray. That seems to be the way it is with my whole life. When I get myself in such a mess, I can't get out of it. I am, and I, t sorry. When I get myself in such a mess, I can't get out of it. I turn to God. When will I ever learn that if I put him in charge from the first, that life would be so much better and certainly a lot simpler. Then she finishes here with these last three paragraphs. My paintings are created totally by emotion. I begin with much fear trepidation. I muddle along, teetering between joy and despair. I have even been known to throw my painting across the room. I cry, I laugh, I can't sleep, and finally the painting is finished. But there's always another one forming in my mind before the last one is finished. I thank God every day for letting me lead such a wonderful life, doing for a living what I love, and for a very good and considerate husband that helps me so much and prods me along when I am at my low points. He laughs and tells people what all he has to go through during the course of one of my paintings. I always disagree with him, but I know every word he says is true, and I am just thankful he doesn't tell all. These are just some of the basics that work for me, but I have found that everyone is different and has to do it his own way. I said at the beginning that it would be hard to separate the technical from the emotional, and as you can see, I have wandered back and forth fearing I have spent more time on the latter. For me, that is what painting is, taking my innermost thoughts and feelings and putting them on canvas. And probably a lot of her most innermost thoughts and feelings are what a lot of us have. And that's why her paintings are so popular, because she is able to bring out of her head onto the work in front of her, her innermost feelings and emotions. And a lot of those feelings and emotions are common to us all. I mean, we all have days with our spouses where we're just at absolute consternation as to why they can't see our point of view. And they, in turn, have the same problem. Because quite often, generally speaking, Women are more emotional than men, and men are more practical and think things, think in a different way. So therefore, they're more looking at the practical, logical side of things. Um, and naturally enough, it can come into conflict. But at the same time, it's a great counterbalance, you know, which everybody needs a counterpoint, you know, otherwise well, it wouldn't be very good. <laughs> I don't think it would be very good. Anyway, so here's another. Paula has a website uh, where she sells her artist proof prints, open edition prints, original oils, watercolour originals, cross stitch patterns and so on. And this is the, the, the uh, picture that Harlequin has printed out for me. I, I asked him to print some of Paula's works out for me and that's the thing with me I mean I can be going along you know I'll have a lot of different topics in my head uh, and about what I may present on a video but it doesn't really come in until a few days before and then the poor man is there printing <laughs> these for me 
um, at very short notice, which I really do appreciate because he's a planner. So it does tend to stick in his gears a bit that he has to turn around and start doing things for me. So I am very grateful for him doing that. Um, right, so anyway, here are some of Paula's paintings that we can just end up on. This one, uh, just picked John Quills, she's got there. I mean, that's lovely. Then we've got this one, which I think a lot of people will know. The house that love built. And you can imagine the scones and the tea on the table inside waiting for you. That's really lovely. And the little, little cat there. Now this one reminded me very much, Blessed are the Pure in Heart is called, and it reminded me of a little song that we used to have at school when I was little. And the verse, one of the verses from it was, Jesus bids us shine with a clear pure light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness we must shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. And I just love that little verse. And see, she's got the patchwork quilt there and the bear. Even the little bear's praying. I mean, that's very sweet, isn't it? And all the dolls lined up. And then we go on to one of the most, uh, what would you say? One of the most revered, I suppose you'd say, of her work, which is the series of the bride and the uh, the husband, the you know the father of the bride, and all that that little series here. So we've got this one is through mother's eyes, and there is a link below. I've got two links below uh, from Kitty Stitches. That's Kerry uh, from Who Does a Vlog, um, EDS Warrior. Uh, she does a vlog about her daily struggles with her Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, which gives her uh, chronic pain and chronic fatigue and her joints pop out of, you know, position and all sorts of things, but she just keeps battling on. But um, she has done a couple of little videos. Uh, one is of her uh, problems that she had, her challenges that she had when she was stitching this, which of course is the bride before she is married on her wedding day and her mother looking in the mirror and seeing her daughter when she was a, a child. And this is just, I think it speaks to every mother. Every mother knows what this means. And that's why it's so popular. So there's that one. And then there's a companion piece. Which, kid, which Kerry also stitched. And she's got a time lapse of stitching this, which is excellent if you want to have a look at that. Um, through a father's eyes and I think there are so many children young girls that will remember their father doing exactly that you put your foot, feet on your father's uh, feet and he <laughs> he would walk around with you I mean I can remember that so it really speaks to you doesn't it and the father there with his fatherly arm on his daughter's shoulder lovely and here's another one that is perhaps not as widely seen I've just seen that now I don't know if that is an actual painting or if it's one of her I mean a cross stitch or if that's a painting 
that hasn't been made into a cross stitch. It probably has been, it's just that I haven't seen it stitched. Um, and then we have this one. The picture isn't very good, but it's through a mother's eyes too. And this is where the mother is looking into the mirror with her son there, with her loving arm on his back. And of course, there's the little boy there with the little dog, uh, or it looks like a puppy then. And now there's a grown up dog on the floor. I wouldn't imagine it would be the same one, but maybe it is. Who knows? It might be a, a long lived dog. But that again is very poignant and speaks to all parents. Then there was one that I found this morning that there wasn't time time to get my husband to print this off but anyway i shall show you to show it to you uh, grow old along with me by paula Bourne. and here it is and there they are in, probably in the attic oh just hang on a moment trouble with my with iPads is you only have to touch one thing and everything goes haywire right. I'll try not to touch it <laughs> but anyway you can see there the they're probably in the attic you can see all the sporting equipment there in the foreground you can see him trying on his old uniform uh, that's just not a little bit too small for him now. And she's there at the, the chest with the old letters. And it really is, again, evokes many different emotions in whoever is looking at it. So I think that is the thing with this particular artist somehow or other she is able to put out there the messages that we would like to give to someone else through her visual means through visual means she is able if you wanted to if you wanted to stitch something for someone that spoke out your inner emotions I don't think you could go too far wrong by having a look at Paula Vaughan's designs and something there will will pretty much it, um, cover all the things that you want to say put it that way uh, so that you may not have the wherewithal to actually put together the message that you want to give or the feeling or emotion you want to give. She does that work for you. She's come along through divine inspiration to a degree because I think a lot of people who have the temperament that she has because she, she pays great tribute to her husband because he is a very practical person and probably grounds her, keeps her grounded with all the things that are going on. I mean, she must have days where it's, he must have days where it's very difficult to live with someone who is so creative and gets so frustrated with what's in there to put out on the paper. I think that's probably what I'm trying to get round to saying, that uh, people who are very creative can be very mer mer mercurial in their temper, you know, in their temperament. Uh, they can be offhand and, and quite uh, difficult at times. And I think part of it is because the frustration of having it in there and not being able to get it exactly down there. And this is what I think happens with her. 
she starts out with this wonderful thing in her head of what she wants to put on that paper. And then halfway through, she's getting really annoyed because she just can't get there. And then, probably with a bit of help from her husband, she calms down a little bit, sorts herself out, refocuses, and the rest comes through to her. The rest comes through. And then when she finishes her painting, she doesn't really get the full piece that she should have because there's another one forming in her head. Um, so it just goes on and on and on. So uh, I think that's really all I have to say about Paula. She is a real gift to the stitching world. Uh, not just the stitching world either because she does put her paintings out for people. Um, so thank you very much Paula and uh, your husband Tommy <laughs> and uh, I hope to see you all again next time with whatever topic pops into my head and uh, I hope you're all enjoying your stitching and so from Stitch Bliss Corner it's goodbye for now. Bye bye. <laughs>